Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session, Pix Insight and Photoshop, Parallel Paths, and it's going to be presented by both David Alt and uh, Josh Smith. Um, there is no image of the week because we need you guys to uh, start posting more images so we have something to choose from. Um, and uh, in the future, we're hoping to get something planned with that to make it a bit easier. Um, before we go into the presentation, though, uh, we did have one announcement that uh, I was going to let David all make. Um, if you guys wanted to uh, see him in person, here's your opportunity. Uh, David, camera's yeah. on. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm doing the, uh, the workshop at the uh, RTMC Expo. Uh, it, this is uh, May, May 29th, right, Alex? I think uh -huh. so. It's the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. Right. So it's a, a four-hour workshop. Um, so I'm going to cover a whole whole bunch of things. Um, you know, some some kind of very basic uh, astrophotography stuff. You know, how images are formed, some statistics and noise, what these things are, what you know, what's actually going on when you're calibrating, as well as some more advanced topics. You know, uh, you know, kind of in depth in in noise reduction. Uh, some of the typical things that you do when you're processing an image and kind of going through all those um, in, in a lot more detail in a, a four-hour workshop. Um, so I just wanted to, to put it out there. Um, RTMC has a, a website that you can look at and get more more information. So if you just uh, Google, you know, RTMC Expo, uh, I think it'll you'll find it and come up. And there's also a post in the Cloudy Nights forum under the uh, conferences uh, uh, topic. Um, that I guess it was Martin that, that posted the topic there. Can I, uh, can I say a few things? Every year, the Riverside Astronomical Society, I'm part of that, uh, puts on a couple of conferences, a couple of imaging workshops. One of them is at RTMC, and the other one is at uh, Nightfall, which is in October. And we're pleased to have David coming out for this one. Um, the, I, obviously, there's a lot you can learn from sitting there and, and listening to a presenter go on um, most of the day, the Sunday. You know, it's a, it's a long time, long presentation. Um, but you also, if the really cool thing about being at the workshop is that you're sitting next to a bunch of people that are doing the same kind of thing you're trying to do. I mean, if you get off on, on watching us every Sunday night, um, imagine if you're able to turn to the guy next to you up at RTMC up here and just say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, how do you do that? And uh, you get into these little discussions, you go off to lunch with the people, and and it's really cool to be able to actually meet the people, um, and when you don't understand something, they can see it in your face that you don't understand it. And so David will say, hey, wait a minute, I, I, you guys didn't get that, let's try it again. Right. And it's a, it's a little bit better than, than sitting here on the Astro Imaging channel. But it's an opportunity for everybody to come together up in the mountains, up at RTMC, which is always fun anyway, and uh, you can get something out of it. RTMCAstronomyExpo.com, I think. Uh, or .org, .com, I think. RTMC Astronomy Expo. Just Google it, and you'll find the information about registering. And uh, it does cost a little extra to go to David's show. It'll cost 50 bucks, but uh, it's less than 800 bucks that you'd spend on a Pix Insight workshop or, you know, I don't know what Adam Block charges and those kinds of things. But uh, um, And he'll be worth every penny of it. I sure hope so. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, um. We just wanted to put that out there. If anybody have any questions about it, you go ahead and, and Google in your questions now, or yeah, just type them into your comments and things. Yeah, Q and A is uh, enabled, so you guys type your questions in. Uh, our Riverside, right? Riverside, California. Uh, well, we're from the Riverside Astronomical Society, which is in Riverside, California. But RTMC Astronomy Expo is held in Big Bear, California, up in the mountains, up above uh, San Bernardino. And uh, it's a it's a big. I mean, I'm going to be up there starting Wednesday, but I think they open up the gates on Thursday, and you come up there. And uh, <coughs> I've been to all the big star parties: the Texas Star Party and Winter Star Party, Oregon, Grand Canyon, and uh, Winter. I guess. Did I? Anyway, um, and RTMC has the best program of any of them. There's several venues going, uh, lots of presentations going on, lots of different speakers. Um, Lots of observing going on, um, imaging, some people imaging. We've got some a good beginner's corner and, um, you know, a lot of places to, to ask questions and visit and see what's happening. There's some vendors there, probably a couple of dozen vendors. 
Um, they're nice to see. Not like it used to be in the old days with 1,900 people, but still seven, 800 people come up there, and we have a pretty good time. Wow, seven, 700 people. Yeah, bring your gear. That's cool. Um, okay. Well, uh, basically then I'm just going to hand it right over to you guys, uh, Josh, and, Josh and David. And I don't know how, however you guys started, I'm in charge of the camera, so uh, if you guys out in Q&A land can't see the person that's talking, let me know. Hey David, <clears throat> were you able to post a link to our data as well to start? Yeah, I forgot to give that to Alex. Let me uh, let me bring that up real quick so everyone can see the data here. Uh, let me uh, stop sharing real quick. Uh, all right, so this up. If you throw it in chat, I'll put it on the uh, in the event thread. And while David's grabbing that, just to help explain sort of what we're doing tonight, is that uh, we took a little while and sat down together and thought about a handful of processes that um, that I like to do in Photoshop and David likes to do in PixInsight, and we talked about what the best way is to kind of compare the, uh, the two programs for processes that I guess are uh, normally done by every imager, and we wanted to make them sort of finite steps and be able to compare and contrast what we are doing uh, in, in each of those steps. And we are going to try and present it as much as possible in sort of a chronological format. So um, I guess in that link, David has posted, and it will be in the uh, thread for this uh, presentation, we have saved the final images that we both did, and we also saved the uh, beginning and in-between images as well, um, so that way you can actually kind of download the data and follow along with us, or if you're watching it later, you can download it. We'll keep it up there for a while. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go back and forth, and we'll kind of describe what we're doing. Uh, David will probably do it in Insight, then I'll do it in Photoshop. We'll probably be pretty brief as we go through it, and then we'll uh, pause at each step and ask for questions. So Dave, do you want to start with the uh, first set and let them know what you're going to use? Yeah, so I'm, I'm bringing it up right now. So um, I actually renamed mine a little bit so that they would be in order, but you, you can kind of see from the name exactly what they are uh, in the, the Google Drive that, uh, that we posted. Um, so what we have that we started off with, because Josh normally starts off with a slightly stretched version of the data uh, in Photoshop, we just decided to start from the same point. Um, so the first part that we're going to talk about is just stretching the data. And you know it's it's a little different in between Photoshop and and uh, PixInsight. So I'll I'll kind of go through what I normally do when I'm stretching my data. So I've got this uh, NGC 7331 data. That's actually a combination of Josh and my uh, data together. Um, and typically what I do is um, you know I'll just start off and I typically manually use um, the histogram transformation. You, you can bring up the preview, which gives you an idea of what's going on. So that's this little circle down in the bottom of the histogram transformation process. And it'll bring up this window so you can see real time what's happening as you uh, move the sliders around, right? So you can kind of see um, what's going on as I move these. So this middle one is the, uh, the mid-tones adjustment. As I move it, you can kind of see the mid-tones uh, value here shifting around. You can see the image get brighter and darker. Um, this is the shadow point. As I move it up, you can see I clip a bunch of values, and it'll actually tell you how many values I'm clipping. I'm, at this level, I'm clipping you know 96% of the image, which is not good. Uh, and then you can bring in the, the whites, the highlights as well. Um, so you can see as I do this, the, the core gets more and more essentially overexposed. It just all goes to a value of 1 as I bring this in. Um, so generally what I'll do is I, I'll start off just by um, clipping the shadows and highlights with these auto zero functions. This just means that anything that, um, you know, it, it sets this at whatever the maximum value is here or whatever the minimum value is here. In this particular image, the value, minimum value is already 0, so it doesn't do anything to the shadows, and it brings the the highlights in a little bit. Um, and then I just kind of bring in the midtones until the image looks uh, about the way I want it. 
Um, generally, for, for fields like this where there's a, you know, it's primarily galaxies and stars, I kind of want, I kind of like the midpoint sitting about the, uh, the one-eighth mark of the histogram. So that's um, one-eighth from the left edge of the histogram. Um, so I, I kind of target around there and I'll adjust a little bit higher or lower. This one's got some IFN in the field, so I, I tend to push it a little bit higher than that so you can see the IFN a little bit. So that looks pretty good to me. So I'll go ahead and uh, just apply this to my image. Uh, if your image is the active one, I'll back, so I back out the change, you can also uh, just hit the apply button here. Um, or you can s pull down and select your image and then hit apply. Um, I've gotten in the habit of just dragging this off so that uh, you know I know exactly what image everything's being applied to when I do it. And you can also save this off to the desktop so it can be replayed exactly, uh, you know, exactly how you did it. Uh, one other little point is that uh, PixInsight has a history function. So I can select my image and see everything that I did to it. So the initial state here is just reading in the information. Um, but I, then I can see I did this histogram transformation process to it. Um, and this is you know, fully uh, accessible. I can actually double click this and bring up the histogram transformation function with those settings. Or I can drag this off to the desktop. Um, and this is effectively the same thing as this guy here. Uh, so I can replay that function later on in any any way I choose. Uh, so now that I've got this uh, stretched, I'm going to uh, you know bring the core in a little bit. There's there's a few ways to do this, and and the way Josh is going to do this in in Photoshop is a little different than what I'm going to do here. I'm actually going to use the uh, um, the uh, HDR multi-scale transform tool. Um, so I'm just going to put it in median mode here and just run it and see see what I get. So it's uh, well actually, let me reset everything to default. Um, so the defaults have it on six layers. I'm going to turn on median mode and apply this to the lightness and uh, the lightness mask and um, see what I get. So you can see it kind of darkened things up and, and built a little contrast in, but it didn't really bring the... Uh, Sorry, the peak of the, the galaxy down too much. So I'll try a different layer. Um, that looks a little bit better in the core, um, but a little too dark in here. So what I might do is actually just mask uh, the data a little bit to, to prevent it from being too aggressive. And to do that, I'm just going to um, pull the image off, and I'm going to use pixel math to set this to uh, just a value. I'm going to set it to 0.25. This just gives me a, a very, you know, perfectly even, all values are 0.25 across the image. And if I use that as a mask, it will limit um, how much the effect of this is. So you can see that brought it in a little bit. So that kind of brings in the core a little bit in there. Uh, and gives me a little bit of extra contrast. All right, so then I can you know I can close those out. You can just keep the images around if you prefer, uh, whatever you want to do with the data. Um, and I think at that point I'm ready to go into uh, uh, the next step. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Josh. <clears throat> okay, thank you, David. So a lot of what we do is probably actually pretty similar um, between Photoshop and PixInsight with kind of, uh, you know, diff different tools to do it. But um, I'll kind of step you through the same things that David stepped you through there. Um, kind of like there is a history uh, thing in Photoshop. There's also a history thing in, or sorry, in PixInsight. There's also one in Photoshop. Um, and you can also see down here in your layers sort of the history of what you're um, so, same thing that I'll do as David is I'll create a new layer. You can either drag down here to do that or copy and paste a new layer. We won't do too much on the fundamentals, um, but we'll talk more about stretching here. Uh, so, usually when I stretch, I like to start out with a level stretch. Um, so, I'm going to pull that up uh, right here, and you can do that by going up to Image, Adjustment, and then Levels. 
Um, and so you can see this histogram sort of like David was showing you. Um, there's not a lot of separation off the wall, so uh, probably don't need to bring in the black point at all. White point needs to come in just a tiny bit. And then kind of like his uh, initial stretch, I will also bring up my midpoint slider. Um, typically, I like to do this in just a handful of steps. Usually, I'll go up to like 1.3 or something like that. And I will do this uh, until I get a peak background value of around 30. Um, usually, I'm trying to work uh, with my background around 30 throughout the image, and then I can set it at the end where I want it to be. Um, the best way to actually keep track of that is to go to image. Um, if you're working in a grayscale image, it needs to be in color to get to get it to work with these values. Um, so I would probably change the mode to an RGB color. And once you do that, you come over here to the color sampler tool, um, and you do that by right clicking on this little uh, pipette looking thing, then left click on the color sampler tool. And I'll just put probably four of these uh, around the image. Uh, because of the IFN, there's kind of, you know, you can see it throughout the field. There's not uh, dark regions as much down in the bottom left, so I'll kind of carefully do that. You can see right now um, around 11, 15, 14. Um, so I'll probably do one more stretch here with this. And that brings it up even a little bit brighter than I want it to be. Um, or it's about right, I guess. Yeah, it's right about there. <clears throat> and so part of what happens whenever you do that big stretch, same thing with David, is that the core of the galaxy really kind of gets blown out. And also the uh, stars really start getting pretty big. And you don't want either of those things to happen. So. What I like to do is use a mask sort of the same way that David did, um, but what I want to do is just bring back stars a little bit, and I want to bring back the, um, the core of the galaxy a little bit, and I won't do any contrast enhancement here. So to do that, one of the simplest ways that I like to do that is actually to come in here and take a copy of the image as it is right now. You can do that by select all and then edit, copy, merge. And then I'm going to create a new background layer. And I showed you just a minute ago how to do that by dragging this down here. And then once I do that, I'll put that on top by just dragging it up on top here. And you can see what it does is it darkens the whole image again. But I don't want to uh, darken the whole image. All I want to do is darken the brightest parts. So I'm going to use that mask that I just created, and I'm going to put this in the image right here. And you can see what that does <clears throat> is it should be bringing in this galaxy just a little bit here. You can see how kind of the core goes from being super bright to pretty well controlled. You can see some more details in the dust. You can also see that the stars go from being pretty large and blown out, a lot of these stars here to quite a bit more control. And so it brings down the peak intensity in the middle a little bit and actually brings in that profile some. Um, <clears throat> so you can also control how much of that layer you want to apply by just sliding your opacity. Um, David brought his down a little bit for the step he used in Pix Insight. I actually like to keep mine pretty high when I do this um, because my range mask um, that I'll open again here actually helps kind of just control that opacity right there. So I'm actually pretty happy with where this is as a stretch right now. Um, I guess I think that we're going to do just a tiny bit of noise reduction before it combined. So this is probably where I'm going to leave my stretched image right here. So I can hand it back over to David to take the uh, next steps. All right. So the uh, the next thing we're going to do is is stretch the uh, the color data. Um, so we have the uh, the color information here, um, and so we're going to bring that up. So I'm going to do something similar. I'm just going to uh, to stretch this up. Um, you know, the, this one doesn't really need any clipping on the whites. Uh, some things are already at uh, max value anyway, uh, but the shadows are a little, um, you know, in a little bit. So I'll bring this in. Um, if you use the auto zero function here, 
it will cl it will clip and set them to zero, but it does that per color channel. So if I look at the combined RGB, it doesn't do it here. It does it under RGB, and that will set them at different points. Um, in this case, the uh, the green is the smallest. Um, so what I can do is I can just copy this out and paste it in here after resetting the, the values, and now that gives me a clip right at zero. Um, and then I'll start bringing the values up. Um, bring up my preview so I can see what I'm doing. Um, so I can bring up the values a little bit here, and uh, that looks pretty good to me, so I'm going to go ahead and apply that. And so that's looking pretty good. Um, I actually want to to build a little more contrast in, in, in this guy here, um, I'm going to bring up the curves and actually adjust the curves a little bit. Um, so I'm going to bring the area below the histogram down and the area above up a little bit um, just to add a little more contrast into the image. So it's a, a fairly similar process. I'm not actually going to go through and adjust the the brightness in here. That kind of gets evened out once we do the color combine. Um, so I'll leave this pretty much as it is before I go into the, the combination here. All right. Back to you, Josh. Thanks, David. So one thing that we'll do a little bit differently here is that when I stretch my color data, I actually like to uh, saturate the uh, color a little bit as I actually stretch. Um, we did a little bit of uh, saturation enhancement in PixInsight before um, bringing this over to Photoshop. So it was just, I think it had a little mild saturation increase in it, but uh, Really, this data was just really good and very colorful to start with, so I won't have to do a lot of color saturation to the color channel. Um, but the main things, the main points that I like to bring up when I'm stretching colored data, uh, like I said, is that I want to do kind of iterative stretching, uh, saturating at each of those iterative steps with uh, masked saturation, and I want to bring the background up to about the same intensity level as the luminance channel, if not just a little bit darker. So what I'm going to do is I created this uh, new layer already. And usually when I'm doing my initial color saturation, I like to do that with uh, match colors. So I'll make this, uh, this copy here. And I'll go up to Image, Adjustments, uh, and then Match Color, which you can find right there. And I'll usually actually pump this up quite a bit. Um, on the first few because I'm going to mask it. So it's not actually going to have that full effect. But I'll probably bring it up to somewhere around 175, something like that. And as you can see, whenever I do that, it really makes that color, color just pop. Um, so once I do that, I want to actually put this range mask on it. So same thing as before, I'll do select all, edit, copy, merged. And to make sure that it is not going to be too intense, so I will actually create a new mask. So I'll create the mask here and plug it in here. And you can see that really helps kind of hold it back. So enabling and disabling that mask, you can see there's a big difference. This helps really just to get a lot of star color into the center of these stars that are going to end up being really bright um, before I start stretching them too much. So I'm going to do another mild stretch now, and I'm going to start by making a new layer before doing that mild stretch. And now I'll bring this up. You can see that's brightening up pretty quickly already. So as I mentioned before, let's just keep an eye on the background values. Not too bright yet, but they're getting up there already. Um, so I'm going to make one more layer. I'm going to do another saturation stretch, or color intensity stretch, sorry. And I'm going to do the same thing as before, where I put a range mask on that. Okay. 
and then we'll do one more set to get us up to basically the same value as the luminance image. And I did one backwards there, sorry about that. I did the saturation on the wrong layer there. We wanted to do it on this layer. <clears throat> and the nice thing about working in layers, as you can see, I kind of forgot to put in my, uh, my layer mask here um, for the actual saturation. Let's see, where did we go wrong here? Put in the layer mask on this one. Put in the layer mask on this one. <clears throat> and then I'm going to put in the layer mask on this one. And at this point, David, I am ready to hand it back to you. Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and do uh, my saturation boosting here. Um, so there's a couple ways to, to do the saturation boosting uh, in PixInsight. You can do it in a curve form um, using the curves transformation uh, and the saturation um, setting here. So just to, as a quick to, to show you what's going on, if I uh, just click somewhere in, in the middle of the graph and start bringing up, you can see the, uh, the saturation increase um, in the image. Um, but there's also a, uh, a color saturation process. Right? Um, so I can bring that up again. Um, and so if you just move this up, you'll see the saturation increase uh, across the image. Both, both work pretty well. Um, this is uh, more of a straight, and you can actually manipulate this curve if you want to focus more on, you know, the reds or the blues or something. You can actually, uh, you know, bring this up and and you know make the the reds a little little more uh, saturated than the blues are. So you can really kind of manipulate this curve a lot. Um, in this case, I'm just going to bring the uh, the overall levels up a little bit, and like Josh, I'm going to uh, use an image to kind of uh, um, control what's going on with the colors. In this case, I'm going to just take the luminance data and I'm going to, uh, to make a star mask off of this. Um, so since this is already stretched, I'm going to change the settings I have here and uh, really kind of bring up the uh, noise threshold and midtones and see what kind of stars I get off of this. Um, so if I kind of move this over, I'll check to see if it kind of maps the stars pretty well, and it looks like it, it does, so that was a, a pretty good one. Uh, and then what I'm going to do, generally in my images I, I like the stars to have a little less color than the galaxies or nebulosity. So what I'll do is I'll actually uh, bring up pixel math and subtract out um, the stars uh, or the star mask from this image. So dollar sign T in this expression says and I'm going to um, affect the target image. This is the target image minus the star mask image. And if I just apply that here, you can see that all my stars basically go away. Um, I tend to, to blur this a little bit. So I'll use the convolution um, so this will, you can adjust the kernel size and, and shape of your um, point spread function here for what you're going to convolve, uh, but it's effectively just a blurring function, so that just kind of smooth things out a little bit. Um, so I'm going to use that on my image, 
and you can see that the uh, the galaxy and you know a few other things are, are exposed in there. So I'm going to hide the visibility of the mask. It's still applied. You can see the tab is a different color here. Um, so now if I uh, look at the slider and see, I can see that the galaxy itself is getting increased, but the stars are not really uh, increasing in saturation much, uh, which is kind of what I, I want for an initial saturation stretch. So if I zoom in and look at this, it's like it's a reasonable improvement there. I'm going to do another pass that's probably a little bit less. And then I'm going to remove the mask. So this will remove the mask and then uh, stretch again. So this way I get a little bit more color in the stars. Um, so that brings me in the saturation. Now, now if I look at the data, uh, and I'll kind of go into the next step um, here, um, it's, it's pretty noisy in the color, uh, color data here. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to do is actually do a, uh, a color noise reduction. So I'll keep my star mask around. I'll move that down here, but I don't really... Uh, actually, I'll, I'll keep this one up uh, as well. So I'll keep this image around. Um, the next thing I want to do is actually do the chrominance reduction, noise reduction. Um, typically what I do is I take... Um, you know, the, the luminance information, this can be extracted from your color, or since we have a luminance channel, I'm going to use that. And I'm just going to bring it up so that the midpoint is at about uh, one quarter of the histogram. Brighten it up a little bit. And I'm going to apply this as a mask to my image. And I'm going to invert it. This little button inverts the mask. So you can see uh, this is what it looks like normally. This is inverted. Uh, so this would expose the galaxies and stars. I want them protected. Uh, this exposes the background. Uh, it's being manipulated. Uh, and then I'm going to use this uh, um, multi-scale medium uh, transformation process. Generally, I use fairly aggressive settings for this. You can see that in each one, I'm using a, a threshold of 10 uh, for the first several layers and then a threshold of five, and I kind of step down as I get to larger and larger layers. Um, but because I'm going to apply only to the chrominance information, um, it doesn't do, it's not nearly as destructive. So I'm going to go ahead and apply this. Won't take too long to run. Um, and you can see certainly in the background, the, uh, the chrominance noise, um, really improves. So this is, uh, or in fact, my mask may be a little too aggressive here, so I may need to back it off. It's not uh, not allowing enough to go through. I'm going to back that off a little bit and try it again. That's a little bit better. A little bit you can see, especially like in this region here, you can see all the color information kind of really tones out. Um, typically that re you know removes a little bit of color so I, I may choose to uh, boost the colors a little bit more. In this case I think they're okay. I may do some post uh, tweaks. Um, so I'm going to leave it, leave it alone uh, here. And then I'm going to do one more pass to clean this up uh, and I'm going to use TGV denoise to do that, um, to actually noise reduce the, the uh, luminance of this color information. Um, so if I reset this to defaults, I'm going to run actually in uh, lab mode, although when I'm testing I'm going to turn off the chrominance, so I'm just doing luminance at the moment. I typically use 500 iterations and I'm going to just run it full out. I'm going to turn on the local support and I may look to see my midpoint is uh, at about 1.25. I'm going to see what it takes to stretch it to about 0.25. And that's uh, a mid-tone stretch of about 0.276. So I'm going to take that and apply it here. Um, and then I'm just going to uh, take a preview and, and select a small area. 
something that covers the core, some background, and maybe another structure, and just see what I get. Nope, not back too far. That cleans up the, uh, the luminance, and because this is just going to be used for color information, I'm kind of okay with this being a really aggressive noise reduction. You can see that there's so, still some color noise in the highlights, so I'm going to turn on the uh, luminance noise reduction. The only thing I'm going to change is the iterations. I'm going to try that again. It takes a little longer to run. That looks uh, maybe a little too much. I lost some color in the stars. I'm going to back that off a little bit. Back that off to maybe one, and I may back off this a little bit as well. It won't go far. I'll go to 1.5. That looks pretty good. I still see color on the stars, but the the background got cleaned up a lot, and the color information is pretty clean now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run this on, on this image, and in the meantime, uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Josh. <coughs> Thanks, David. Um, so I flattened the image that I was working with. Uh, typically, I wouldn't do that. I would probably put it all in the folder and give it a label. Um, but what I'm going to do now is the same thing as David. Um, before combining the luminance and the RGB, I like to uh, bring down the noise on the RGB first, and then we'll go work on the luminance and get the luminance uh, kind of the de details and contrast and enhanced and a little bit of noise reduction on that, and then we'll combine them. So working on the uh, color data, I'm happy with the background level. I'm pretty happy with the saturation level in the stars, but you can see there's just a lot of different kind of noise in here. Um, Star edges have a little bit of funky stuff going on around them. Uh, the background's got some uh, speckling in it that's not very good. So I'm usually willing to be pretty aggressive with the noise reduction on the color. Um, although I've gone less and less uh, do I use the actual noise reduction tools, uh, such as in Amy's actions and in the astronomy tools, which are both great also. Um, but I've gone more to just using the uh, Photoshop tools for doing my noise reduction. So the first one I like to do across the entire color image is going down to noise and speckle. And right off the bat, that kind of gives it a tiny bit of a blur, and you can see if I activate and deactivate that layer, it helps smooth out some of those kind of real dark holes in the image. <clears throat> and then I do two more steps. So I'm going to make a new layer. And the two steps that I like to do here are a broad uh, Gaussian blur uh, across the whole image kind of globally, but um, with just sort of a very uh, mild effect. Um, and so usually I will do that one. It's something like maybe 1 to 1.1, 1 1.2 1 pixels. Um, what I'm trying to use this one for is both for the background and for the brighter parts to make sure that there's no, no noise in the brighter parts of the image. So if I zoom in here just enough, you can see that there's just a little bit of kind of uh, speckling noise in the galaxy here that I want to get rid of. Some of the star edges are just a little bit funky. And I want to take care of those. So I run that 1 to 1 1.2 pixel Gaussian blur. And then I want to take care of the background um, and really kind of get any color out of the background as well as any noise out of the background. So I'm going to make one more new layer. <clears throat> and for this one, I might run just a slightly higher Gaussian blur. And I might run this one at something like 1.5 to 2 pixels. So I'll just put it somewhere in the middle here. Um, however, I don't want this to apply to everything, including the bright spots, because that data was already pretty much noise-free. Um, so what I'm going to do is the same thing as before. I'm going to use this mask. And I'm going to invert this mask this time, um, because I don't want to touch the bright parts. I only want to touch the background here. 
And so as in Photoshop, white reveals and black conceals. So you can see I'm kind of blocking out the bright areas and the stars, but I actually want to block them off just a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is do a curves adjustment to the mask. Kind of like in Fixed Insight, you can adjust the mask while it's being applied. You can do the same thing in Photoshop. And it's kind of cool because you can actually watch that effect in the image too. So if you click over on the mask and then do any kind of curves adjustment or levels adjustment, you can see what happens. So if I make this curve here, which is essentially you can see down here darkening the whole image and it's stretching the stars some. If I click this preview on and off button, I don't know if it's easy to see on the uh, video, but you can see that there's a distinct difference with the preview on and off where it kind of gets this modeling effect when that curve is not applied. And as soon as it's applied, that modeling effect starts going away. And so you want to avoid that modeling effect as much as possible. So I'm going to just do a couple more manipulations of this background to get it to be what I want for a mask here. And I'm just going to keep stretching it just a little bit more. Um, to really kind of block out this bright area and reveal a piece and bit of the background. And like David, a lot of times I still like to put a little bit of a blur on my actual mask as well. So I'm going to put just a slight blur, probably like a two pixel blur on the background. Um, and let's kind of come over here and look at this dark region. Uh, put this layer on and off and you can see, yeah, so there's kind of a lot of real dark holes over here in the image that um, go away with this blur without getting too much of a modeled effect. But the other thing I see is just a little bit of color that I don't want in there. Um, so because I have this mask already blocking most of the stars and the uh, galaxy, I can actually come in here and do a desaturate or a match color and bring down the color, either one. Um, so I will go into image adjustments and, um, sorry, this time you need to actually click on the image you're working on instead of the mask to get this to work. But image, adjustments, and come down to hue saturation. And you can actually see while we work on this what this will do to the background. And again, I don't know how easy it is to see in the, uh, in the actual uh, video, but this is actually definitely bringing down some of this kind of green background uh, that I have here. So I'm going to bring that down a good bit. And what I want to do is make sure I still have good color in my stars. So if I look on these last couple of layers that are reducing the noise, what I'll do is I'll put them all into a folder and see what it looks like, what the difference looks like here. So uh, you can see that I'm pretty liberal with how I treat the color data. Um, I've lost a little bit of star color that I really don't want to lose, especially down in these guys. Um, so I might take that whole folder and bring the opacity level down just a little bit, enough that I'm not losing all my star colors. And then the other thing I might do is come in here, make one more new layer, and use that layer as a mask, and just increase the sat uh, saturation here. <clears throat> And I'll do that the same way, the color intensity and the match color. And that's bringing back just a little bit of that color I lost. But it's only applying it to the stars in the galaxy and not to the whole image, just like before. So, yep, I'm pretty happy with what happened there. Um, and then the last thing is that you'll notice if I put all of these into a folder, the noise reduction routine, my stars kind of get a little bit bloated. Um, and I don't want them to be too bloated because I'm a little bit worried if they're bloated that I'm going to get uh, halos around my stars whenever I combine it with the luminance. Uh, bring this opacity up a little bit more. So <clears throat> what I'll do then is one more layer and I want to reduce the stars just a little bit here. Um, you can use any action you like, but one of the ways you can do it um, manually, if you don't have any actions, you can go down to filters, other, uh, minimum, and drag this over so you can see it. You want to make sure that you're preserving the roundness when you do this. Um, and you can actually see the preview here. If you go that far, it's going to make the stars basically disappear. So you can use this very conservatively. Um, 
and we'll turn the preview on and off in there. That's that's a much better effect there. So this isn't really touching the star color. It's just making the stars a little bit smaller. I might even go down just a little bit more, down to 0.2 this time. Um, and the other thing that I want to do is make sure I'm not touching any of the background with this, because if I do, then it'll start introducing more artifacts. So I'm going to do the same thing as always, and I'm going to come in here and put on this uh, layer mask. And what this does um, is just make sure that I'm actually only minimizing more so the bigger and brighter stars. Um, and I might just do just a little bit more. There we go. And so I feel like this color data is ready to combine with my luminance. So I'll hand it back over to David, David now. All right, so, uh, so now I'm going to work on my luminance data and clean it up a little bit. Um, so, so generally what I'll do is I'll start off with a, uh, a, a noise reduction pass. Uh, what I tend to do is I'll, I'll make a clone of the image and do my noise reduction on that. Um, so I'm going to bring up uh, TGV again. Um, don't need chrominance on. Um, the, it, you can run this actually in either mode in, in grayscale. It's just going to effectively only work in on one color channel. Um, so what I'll I'll do here is I'll just uh, take a another preview window so I can see what's what's going on uh, fairly quickly, and uh, I will. Uh, just use the defaults and see what happens. My guess is it's going to be a little too much. Um, actually, it's not not too bad. It's a pretty much kills all all noise in the background. Uh, but I also see a little detail loss in in the middle. So I'm going to back that off a little bit. Uh, I'll try uh, go down and try eight so that it gives me a point zero 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 eight. And I'll just keep backing this off until it looks looks about right to my eye. Five. That's a little, not quite enough. Bring it back up to uh, seven, maybe. All right. So I'm going to apply this to the full image, which uh, shouldn't take too long. Um, and typically what I'll do is I'll do a pass of TGV um, and then I'll also do a pass of multi-scale median transform. TGV is very good at killing the, uh, the high frequency noise um, but not very good at killing this kind of intermediate noise and so there tends to be a modeling effect. Uh, with this image though it was clean enough that there really isn't any modeling effect left uh, or if it is it's, it's pretty well hidden. Uh, let me uh, kind of push this in. Yeah, I can't even see any real modeling here, so I'm going to say that's pretty good. Uh, leave that as is. Um, now, there is still a little detail loss in the galaxy itself. So instead of just taking this image as is, what I'm going to do is blend it back in. So I'm going to use this noise reduced image itself as a mask and apply it to my image. Um, so it's active now. I'm going to invert it, uh, bring up pixel math again, and this is what I'm going to do is effectively the same as doing a layer blend in Photoshop. I will actually rename this guy NR so it's a little easier to plug him in. So this is my noise, noise reduced image uh, called NR. This is my image I'm going to apply this to, uh, dollar sign $t. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm taking um, some value a, I'll set this to say 0.5, and uh, the conjugate of a, this is effectively just um, 1 minus a. Um, so all that, that tilde does is create that 1 minus a uh, shortcut. Um, so if I set this to say 1, then all I'm going to get is one for this and uh, it'll just be this image and this value will be zero. If I set it to 0.5 then this value will be 0.5, this one will be 0.5 and I'll essentially get a 50 percent blend between the two. Uh, so it just gives you a way to control control that. Uh, so I'm going to apply it here 
And when I look around in my image, I can see the, uh, the noise in the background got reduced quite a bit. Um, I'm, I'm liking that result pretty well. So now I'm going to um, remove the mask and do a, a slightly uh, higher blend. So I'm keeping more of the original image now so that I'm not destroying a lot of the structure in here. But I still get a, a slightly additional noise reduction even in the higher signal to noise ratio areas. All right. Um, so I'll hide this guy for a minute. And Josh, were you going to do uh, just noise reduction on luminous next, next, or were you going to do detail uh, enhancement as well? I'm going to do them both together, so if you want to go into detail okay. enhancements, go ahead. Okay. So I'll go ahead and go into that. Um, for detail enhancement, uh, I use a couple different processes. Um, for, for larger scales, I use this local histogram equalization. And I typically don't use it with any kind of mask. I'll just use it as is. Um, I'll bring this down a little bit. I'll start with a, a kernel radius of 64 um, and just show you what it does. So that was kind of a subtle change. I'll, I'll put uh, a really aggressive uh, amount on here so you can kind of see what's going on in a really aggressive contrast. Um, so if I look at this, you can see that it's really creating a lot of additional contrast between the structures. Now, I don't want something this much. I just want a little bit of a, an effect, so I'm going to bring it back down to where I was before. Typically, what I'll do is I'll do this at several levels, several kernel sizes, um, to build up just a little bit of contrast between the structures. Um, this kernel size is effectively defining the structure uh, size between which the contrast will be created. Uh, so this is effectively a, a radius of 32, so objects that have a structure size of around 32 uh, pixels will be affected. Um, so that's pretty good. I, I'm, I'm liking that. So the next one I'll do is uh, going back to multi-scale median transform again. Uh, not that one. Uh, this guy, this brings up multi-scale median transform. I'm going to reset everything. Uh, it's fine if I apply this to RGB. It's just a single monochrome layer anyway. Uh, I'll increase the number of layers, and what I'm going to do is um, use this bias value. Um, this is another one that's actually increasing the, uh, um, the range of brightness values for a particular structure size. Um, so I'm going to set this to 0.1. Actually, I'll set it to 0.2 to kind of show you what's going on again. That will be too much, but um, you can see the stars just become um, entirely white and hard-edged. Um, but there's a lot of uh, structure that comes out in the galaxy. The, the contrast between some of these uh, uh, dark lanes uh, and the arms uh, show up a lot better. Um, so it's kind of what we're working for. Uh, but I don't want the stars to get lost. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to uh, my image where I subtracted out the stars and use that as a mask here. Um, so if I look at that, that's going to work on uh, most of the, the disk of the galaxy, a little bit on some of these other ones. Um, so I'm going to try that again, still with the aggressive one. Um, you can see that really brought up a lot of... Uh, detail structure in there. It's still aggressive, too aggressive for me. What I like to do is typically use smaller values and enhance several different structure sizes. So I might start with uh, something small, go to a little bit larger and small again. And that gives me something a little, little more to my liking. I think I'm not going to use the uh, uh, the 8 pixel structure size at all. I think I'm just going to use the first two layers. So that's pretty good. Um, I'm not sure how, how well that shows up over the video. Um, I like that pretty well. It gives me some good, good contrast in there. Uh, but none of the stars are really affected in the process. They don't, they don't blow it up anymore or anything like that. Um, 
So I'm pretty good with that, that contrast level. Um, so before we go back to uh, combining the color, I'll hand it back over to Josh. Thanks, David. <clears throat> so it's interesting seeing that there are definitely a lot of parallels in Photoshop and Pix Insight and how you can work with this stuff. And so there are, I like to work on any noise reduction and illuminance and sharpening at the same time. And briefly, the reason is because I don't want to do the noise reduction to any of the uh, high signal noise ratio areas because I don't want to lose any of that uh, information in there. There's a lot of really good sharp information in the galaxy dust lines that I don't want to lose. So I don't want to do any uh, noise reduction to that. Um, however, you can see the background, especially on this image because it was stretched a little bit more. It's a little bit noisier. Um, and part of the reason this one's noisier is trying to bring out the IFN. The, um, IFN itself has some good signal in it, but the background got a little bit um, a little bit dark. So what I do usually is actually work on kind of two images together um, when I'm doing this. If I can help it, I won't do any um, I won't do any kind of noise reduction on the luminance, but this one could use a little bit. So I'm going to duplicate this image and the new image uh, I'm just going to label as noise reduction image. I have this noise reduction image. So what I want to do here is work um, on the background. You can see that there's kind of some of this black speckling going on in the background. And to do that, it's going to be very similar to what I did with the color data, only it's not going to be nearly as aggressive. So first step is I'm just going to do a despeckle. And typically, that's almost always one of my first uh, noise reduction things in Photoshop. Um, <clears throat> And then the next thing I'm going to do is create another layer. And again, I'm not going to use them, but you can see over here, um, I think that they're great, especially in low opacity situations where I might use them at 50% opacity. But Annie's Aster Actions has a smooth out image um, that I like a good bit. And I actually really love the astronomy tools. Um, these three right here, the less crunchy, more fuzzy, uh, space noise reduction, and deep space noise reduction. You can use any of those um, in different situations and get really good effects. Like I said, I'm, I'm not going to use them here because I'm going to do everything manually, but um, I highly recommend those actions if you're using Photoshop. But, so anyways, on to the same thing I did before, which is going to be just a slight Gaussian blur to the background. Um, and I'm keeping an eye on what the background looks like here, and it's not quite getting it um, at just 1.4. About 1.4 seems pretty good. It seems pretty smooth to me still, um, without getting a modeling effect. And it seems like it's actually doing a good job of getting rid of almost all of that background noise. Let me do one more little bit of here. There we go. Um, so you can see that this totally killed all the detail in the galaxy. Uh, it also mangled all the stars, which is fine, because we'll deal with that in just a minute. So what I want to do is come back to the original image here, and I want to start sharpening up all of my details. Um, so I'm a big fan of actually using the um, high-pass filtering as a first step for sharpening my images. So what I'm going to do is create four new layers. And same thing as always. Uh, copy and paste the new layers on. So what I like to do is kind of work in structure sizes, sort of like David does. Um, if I'm working with larger images, like with more uh, uh, wide and big nebulosity, I might actually work with three different structure sizes. But uh, when I'm working with galaxies and they only have small details, usually I only work two structure sizes. So I'm going to select my first layer, come up to Filter, Other, and High Pass Filter. And when you come to do a high pass filter, it gives you kind of a preview of what it's going to impact in the image. Um, so I want my first set of layers to kind of give a good differentiation on like the large scale structures of the galaxy. So you can move the slider up and down to see what size structures you want to work on. Um, and it's helpful to zoom out and zoom in to see what's actually going to be impacted. So this one is 
probably going to be wanting to run around maybe 15 to 20 pixels, I think. Zooming out just a little bit, you can see it gives some nice structure in the uh, larger lanes themselves. So I'll incorporate it about 15 pixels. So I'm going to apply that high pass filter to layer one and to layer two. And then for layer three and layer four, um, I want to work with some of the finer details. So for now, um, let's come up here and take a look at this. And let's bring this slider down and see what kind of details we're working with here. And that looks pretty good to me. Uh, about two pixels or so with this picture looks pretty good. It looks like we're going to get right down inside of the dust lanes and start enhancing some of those features. So I'm going to put the high pass filter on for those. And you can see obviously it kind of really totally changes your image. So we want to change the layer type for each of these. So for each set of high pass filters for, for the structure size, I want to use a soft light and an overlay. So the soft light is going to go on top, and the overlay is going to go on bottom. And then we'll do the same thing for the larger structure. And you can see right away this makes a big difference in the actual details, but it obviously destroys the stars, brings all that noise back um, really high into the background, which we don't want to see. So we're going to put each of the two structure sizes into their own folders. And we're going to reduce the opacity on them. I actually like to have a little bit of an offset between the overlay and the soft light. Um, so I'm going to bring down the opacity on the overlay just a little bit. And you can bring these way down, or you can just bring down the folders, however you want to do it. Um, so let's see what this looks like here. When the opacity is brought down, um, they have to basically a screen layer so you can see kind of through the top layer that's impacting the finer structure down to the larger structure image. And you can see what that's doing. So I'm going to zoom out and see what this does kind of on a broad scale on the picture. And I like it, but I think that it kind of brings out just a little bit too much of the little halos around these stars. So I'm going to just turn down that opacity just a little bit more. And then I'm going to work on small scale structures in here and see what this does. And that seems to do a pretty good job. I might actually turn that opacity back up just a little bit. And as you can see, I'm losing the core of the galaxy here, and the stars are all completely blown out. So kind of like with David, you really don't want to see that happening um, when you're enhancing the details. So what I'm going to do is throw these two groups into their own group. And I'm going to create a uh, mask that covers the stars and the brightest parts of the galaxy. Usually I would just use basically a luminous range mask and do that. But um, I'm going to start off with just a color range mask. Um, so sorry if you didn't see that. You can come up to select and then color range and make sure sample colors is uh, selected up top. And then I will pick kind of some, maybe a small bright star. And picking that small bright star with the fuzziness all the way down is going to kind of select just that brightness intensity. But I want to actually mask out most of the bright parts of the picture. So uh, by doing that fuzziness slider, by bringing that up, I'm actually going to block out, as you can see, what's selected here. Um, most of the bright stars are selected, and the really bright region inside the galaxy are selected. Uh, so to actually make sure that I'm definitely not impacting those stars, I can actually come up to Select, Modify, and Expand. And I think I want to expand these by about three pixels. Yep, that's, that's a good um, expansion there, because realistically, there's no reason not to um, expand this quite a bit. And the reason why is because I want to make sure that I'm not touching the stars, and then we're going to make sure I'm not touching the dark background in just a second here. But um, so once you have that expanded well outside of the star profile, then you can just do a slight feather, and I might do a two pixel feather on that. And then I'm going to put a layer mask that actually hides the selection. 
on this. And what you can see is all of a sudden the stars aren't impacted nearly as much, and the dust lanes are getting quite a bit more definition. In them. So that's pretty much exactly what we wanted to do there. Um, you can see that the background is pretty nasty, but we're going to take care of that in just a minute as well. Uh, but I'll do one more kind of sharp sharpening tool that I like to use here. Um, and again, these are just the manual tools. Uh, another set of really great tools in the uh, actions are, and these I think are the best best tools that there are um, in these action sets or in the Annie's action set. There's <coughs> The enhanced dust lanes and the dynamic enhance, uh, especially the enhanced dust lanes. I really like that one. Uh, I think it does a great job. And I'll just do a quick preview for you of each of these actions while I'm in here, just so you can see a quick example of them because they run very quickly. So we'll do an enhanced dust lane. One thing that happens, and maybe I won't do this real quick then, is that if you have a bunch of images open in these actions, sometimes they get a little bit confused about what's happening there. So, see that one actually did not work through. Um, but you can look back. We had Annie on um, and did demonstrations of her tools, and you can actually see those and show them later if we have time after going through this. Um, But I'm going to do an unsharp mask. And the unsharp mask kind of is another tool that really brings out these details pretty well, you can see. But it does the same thing as uh, the high pass filters, which is it blows out the core of the galaxy again and also blows out uh, the stars. So I'm going to bring this up. <clears throat> There's a couple different ways you can control that. One is with the mask, which will apply as well. You can also use this threshold tool. And if you bring that threshold tool really high up, what it's going to do is it's not going to touch those stars. But unfortunately, it's also not going to do as much to the galaxy. So I prefer to work in the mask. Um, same thing. I like that same 1.5 to 2 pixel structure to uh, work on the details here inside of the galaxy. I might bring that amount down just a little bit. And then I'm going to bring the same mask that we just used up here again because I liked it so much. Um, so looking over here, we're going to copy this. So select all, edit, copy, and go ahead and put that same mask on again. And so this helped us again to not really touch those stars too much. So we throw these all together. And I think actually that opacity can be just a little bit high on that unsharp mask. Let's bring that down just a little bit. If we bring all of these sharpened layers together, you can see they really have not touched the stars too much at all. They've only pretty much touched the galaxy. You can see this galaxy's got a lot more detail in the high signal area, um, but obviously the background is just completely destroyed in this. So this is where I'm going to combine the other image right here, this noise reduced image. And this uh, really uh, sharpened image right here. So I'm going to take this whole image, select all, edit, copy merged. And then I'm going to paste it on top of this image here. And what I want to do is only kind of bring over the brighter parts of this image. So I'm going to hide it for just a second. I'm going to use this noise reduced image. as my mask of what I actually want to reveal here. And you can see this brings in a lot of this kind of sharp detail. And it also retains the kind of softer background that's uh, noise reduced. So once you do that, you can play with these opacities a little bit. So I want to bring in more of the bright stuff and less of the dark stuff. So I'm going to come here and play with this mask for just a minute. And I'm going to actually look at it while I'm playing with it for just a minute. And I want to increase the brightness of the mask quite a bit to make sure that I'm bringing in all the really kind of good detail stuff. So I'm going to put a stretch on the mask like that. 
Let's take a look and see what that does. So that mask seems to be doing a pretty good job just with that stretch on its own, getting a lot of details right here in this galaxy. All the details here in the core 7331 looks good. And maybe we'll do just one more stretch there on that. That looks good. That brought even more of the details on the core of the galaxy, but it brought in quite a bit of noise too. So I'm going to bring the black point slider over on the mask. You can see kind of magically as I bring that over, and I can uh, put the preview on and off, all kinds of noise just kind of disappears here in the background. So I'm going to hit OK. This seems like it's done a pretty good job. I think I'm pretty happy with where this ended up. Um, I might just increase the contract just a little bit in the image, and you can do this a bunch of different ways. Again, local histogram equalization is one of my favorite ways to do it with uh, the actions over here, and that would be under astronomy tools. But you can also just do a slight contrast increase here. Kind of darken the background, just brighten the uh, galaxy a little bit. Usually I won't use that too much because I don't like how it does it without uh, with any kind of high intensity. So I'm going to bring that opacity down just a little bit. And then one other way that I might like to actually do that manually is to just do a little bit of a curve. And so I might pick this uh, dark region, which I really want to plant. I don't want to change that too much. And I might pick even kind of one of these midpoint regions, which I sort of want to plant a little bit. And then I might pick a higher brightness region, which I want to bring up just a little bit more. Maybe not that quite, quite that much. And just create basically what is one of those S-curves. And that really helps kind of bring the contrast up on the image. You can see right there that the brighter parts get a little bit more highlighted and the darker parts kind of get a little bit darker. So uh, I think I'm pretty happy with where this is at. And David, I'll hand it back to you to uh, come on. All right. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so we have our, uh, our color image and our, our luminance image here. And uh, so in PixInsight, uh, this is pretty straightforward. There's a uh, LRGB combination process. Uh, typically, what I do is I disable the RGB, and I will pick my uh, luminance frame. So this Lum S01 combined is my, uh, my luminance here. And I'll just go ahead and apply that to my image. So now this is my base for my uh, combined LRGB data. Um, you can see it has most of the, uh, the information from uh, the luminance. And uh, did a pretty good job there. Now, typically, after I have all this in, um, I'll start looking at uh, you know other issues that uh, that arise after doing the combination. Um, you know, it's not not quite perfect, and actually, uh, there's a, there's a few things that I want to change. The noise reduction wasn't quite as good as I, I wanted, and I think it's a little too bright. Um, so I'm going to actually uh, take this and extract. Um, just extract the likeness from it, and I'm going to use effectively a screen mask invert, just like Josh did, to uh, to bring down the brightness. So I'm, I'm going to make a clone of this image as well, and I'm going to effectively unstretch it a bit. So I'm going to bring the brightness down a bit, and uh, then apply this as a mask to my image. So this will affect the brighter areas a bit. And then I want to uh, blend this in a little bit with my image. Let's bring up pixel map again. Uh, I'll just call this guy uh, temp. And uh, I'll keep a, an 80% blend here. It's not quite enough. I'll bring this down a little bit more. So that's a little bit better. Brings brings the brightness down a little bit. Uh, brings a little more color into the, the star peaks. Um, so I'm pretty good with that. I'll go ahead and close this guy out. Uh, I'm going to keep this around, though, and I'm actually going to uh, 
take this guy and uh, really kind of turn him into almost a, a binary mask. Um, so you can see that the, the galaxy and the, the stars are highly protected, and I actually want to protect some of this IFN stuff as well. Um, so I'm going to look at what level this is at. It's kind of on the upper side uh, of this. I'll do another, one more stretch here. Uh, this is an S-curve, just like Josh was talking about. Um, and then I'm going to bring its entire level up a little bit. And I'm going to use this as a mask. So that's actually, I think it's already applied as a mask, but I'm going to invert it. And I'm going to use that to bring the, the background levels down a little bit. So I'm just going to use the histogram transformation and kind of um, bring down the levels. You can The preview will actually show you uh, what's going on uh, in the image, even with a mask applied. Um, so if I you know, really bring it down, you can see that the background levels uh, really go down, but the, the galaxy and, and stars r mostly remain the same. Uh, this is just to build a little extra contrast. You can see, see that the IFN does reduce a little bit, um, so I don't want to be too aggressive on this. Um, so I'll bring it down a little bit, but it builds a little extra contrast uh, into the image. Um, generally, I'll look for other things. I will look for, you know, how's the noise look in the image afterwards. Um, it's not bad. Uh, once I brought the, the levels down, it, it could be a little bit better. Uh, so I may do a, an additional pass of noise reduction. There's a little bit of chrominance noise. You can see, uh, it may be hard to see, but it looks a little reddish in this area. There was probably some uh, light gradients causing some issues. Um, so I might uh, correct that, that region. Um, that can be done the same way. Uh, I'll just bring this level back down a bit again. And uh, invert that. And then I will effectively desaturate the, uh, the background a little bit. So I'll just bring the, uh, the saturation down a little bit. Uh, and that will effectively... Uh, by bringing it down a lot. You still can't see much, but uh, it is starting to eat into the galaxy a little bit, so that's, that's way too much. Um, so I'll bring it down a little bit, and that kind of desaturates this background of this area uh, a bit there. Um, I also tend to do a little bit of star reduction uh, on the image at this point uh, to bring it in, bring the stars a little under control. They're a little little peaked. Uh, they're a little too bright in the, the middles, and uh, so what I'll do is I'll bring up my star mask, apply it to my image, and then I will use the morphological transformation. Now, just like the minimum filter that uh, uh, Josh used, this is the erosion is a minimum here. If I apply it to my image, you can see it really hits the stars hard, so I don't want to be too aggressive, so I'll bring the amount in a little bit, maybe make it 0.5, and just tone the stars back a little bit. This may be even still a, a bit too much. So that's looking uh, looking pretty good to me. I got a, a fair amount of detail in the core. Um, the background's pretty pretty clean, but I haven't really lost any detail or structure in any of the galaxies. So for me, that's uh, generally pretty good. Um, I may do a few few little minor tweaks beyond that, adjusting contrast or saturation in specific areas. Uh, but otherwise, I would call this image uh, pretty complete. All right. Josh, back to you. Thanks, David. So <clears throat> just to answer a point Eric brought up, I think for both of us, there's probably quite a few more little things that we might be doing in between or different methods we would use on some of the uh, processing, but a lot of the point of this is kind of showing certain processes that you can do in both Insight and Photoshop and get them in within a night. So um, <clears throat> definitely open to all kinds of questions uh, after this or even at any other time. We're happy to help uh, and go more into depth in any of these processes in particular. Um, but I will get to combining my LRGB. So like I said, one of the things that I like to do is make sure that my um, luminance and my RGB 
have pretty much the same background level, somewhere between 20 and 30, probably more up towards 30 when I combine them is what would make me happy. In this image, because I increased the contrast already a little bit, uh, the background values are a little bit lower, so I will actually bring down the color background just a little bit um, to get them to match. And let me go ahead and flatten the image first. And I'm just going to bring down the background on the color to get it in the same range. Like I said, I want the color to be, at worst, as bright as the luminance, but really I don't mind it being a little bit darker than the luminance. So I'm bringing the black point slider there just a little bit. And <clears throat> I like to combine the luminance with the color in two different ways. So this time I'm going to make uh, two different color channels, um, so I'm going for two different color images, so I'm going to duplicate this image, and uh, the two ways I like to combine it, one is as a mass luminance layer, and one is as a lightness layer in uh, lab mode, so I'm going to, uh, copy. I'm going to apply it to the first image. And we're going to apply this just as a luminosity layer. And we're going to do that at something like 50% capacity. And then for the poor lab mode, I'm going to change this image into the lab color image. And I'm going to go to the lightness channel and paste in my luminance data here. And then making sure I have all of these selected, I'm going to copy this and bring it back over to this image as a 50% opacity. And I think I'm pretty happy with how that actually combined. Um, let's put those both into a layer and look at what it did. See, there's a slight shift. I think I must have dragged one of my layers a little bit ago. Um, I think it's our data, actually. I think oh, is it? Somehow, <laughs> somehow we got off. There must have been a like one pixel crop or something we didn't account for. Uh, yeah, I noticed the same thing as it was going through. It's like, oh, something shifted. <laughs> so I might be able to just go ahead and take this, which I'm happy with. And I'm going to paste this on top and just take care of that real quick. Make sure. Off by a few pixels, I think. <laughs> well, I'll keep working on, the, on this image as is. Oh, this is why. And, uh, Well, I won't keep this one too much because we got the point across here. Um, so that those are the two ways that I like to actually combine the, these uh, data. One is with a lab mode 50% opacity, and one is a luminosity 50% opacity. And then once I have this image, which I'm pretty happy with, I might come in and change that opacity um, difference just a little bit more. But same thing with David. I can see just a little bit of color noise that I'm still not thrilled with. Um, the other thing that I'll look at once I combine them is how I feel about the colors, how I feel about the star profiles and everything. Um, actually, pretty happy with the star profiles. They look pretty good. There's a little bit of a hard edge on the brightest stars, which I don't love. Um, but overall, it all looks pretty good. Definitely details in the galaxies that I'm happy with. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to select whole thing, and this is where I would just kind of go through my handful of steps to clean up the image at the end. Um, one thing I see is that it's a little bit red shifted from where I'd really like it to be. Uh, so I might take this red channel under selective color, turn down the red a little bit. Just turn up the yellow just a little bit here. And 
to make a new layer to work on the background. Same thing as before. If we want to work on the background only, we'll paste in this mask and we'll invert it. And we'll stretch it quite a bit. And desaturate the background. And we already did this under the color channel, but it's a little bit tough to tell until it actually combines how that works. Um, at this point, you might actually want to use that same minimum filter. And when you're using it on an inverted image, uh, it'll actually grow the stars. And sometimes I'll use that to grow the stars whenever I'm using an inverted mask to make sure I'm protecting the stars a little bit better. And I'll do just a slight blur on that image. And at this point, you could do just a little bit more sharpening if you wanted to, but I think I'm going to call this image done, too. Um, go into more details uh, a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to answer a question there. It says, what is the lab mode process at? Um, I haven't actually gone into understanding the math behind it um, very, uh, very in-depth, so I wouldn't be able to answer that from, I guess, from a statistical standpoint. but. Essentially, it darkens the image up a little bit and seems to put a little more contrast into it. Um, so the lightness mode, or the using the um, luminance as a luminosity layer seems to brighten the image up quite a bit more, and the lab mode seems to kind of darken it and increase the contrast a little bit for me. So I like to combine those two to try and get the best of both. David might know um, mathematically what the lab mode does differently when you apply a lightness layer. Yeah, luminance and light, lightness are different. Um, luminance is effectively the Y component of the XYZ color space, and lightness is the L component of the uh, L lab space. Um, I don't know how to describe it, you know, in, in quick terms, other than the, the math is different, and you know, and how they're they're dealt with. So, so hopefully that sort of answers your question, Eric. That, that's why I do it, um, because of the effect it has, and definitely would be interesting to look more into the math of, of uh, what happens there. But there's, a, there's a really nice, uh, I think Wikipedia has a, a whole section on uh, different color spaces, and they, they go over the XYZ, lab space, HSV, all those things. And it's actually, it's, it's pretty detailed. So, Dave, was there anything else that you wanted to go over? <clears throat> um, no, I didn't have anything else. Um, you know, like, like we said at the beginning, we, we posted the data out there in a, a few different steps uh, so that everyone can take a look at it and, and uh, try to kind of play along. Um, I, I don't know that the process I used was exactly the same as I did for all those steps, so the, it may look a, a little bit different. I'm sure yours is probably the same, Josh, but... Um, <laughs> So I think that's it, Adam. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, really interesting to see them both side by side. In some ways, they're very, very similar. In some ways, they're completely different. Uh, all right, had um, do you guys have the finalized images posted in that Google Drive folder? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that'd be for. Uh, I know it's we're on Google Hangouts, so it's a little bit difficult to see exactly the details you're you're looking for in each one. So that's probably where you want to go to be able to see the specific details. But uh, very interesting. Um, just seeing the processes side by side, and uh, for those of you who I don't know, I don't know if this is just me, but. I think we all start with Photoshop and then maybe say, oh, well, maybe I could use PixInsight, but uh, it's uh, definitely a good way to compare the two. Um, and I, I didn't see any questions coming. Um, I hope that's not because you guys uh, 
uh, didn't have any questions or, or were too confused by it, but uh, follow up with questions in, in uh, the comments after this is over. Uh, after, uh, we'll ask your questions now if you have them. Uh, but it, uh, but it, but it. Is that a question? Is that a question? I'll make a comment. I, uh, I had to, yeah, it's John. I had to uh, get up and leave for part of this just because it's dinner time. But um, <clears throat> David, when you were working in uh, in in Pix Insight uh, and copied uh, your image in order to experiment with what things would do, I just wanted to point out that you can also go in and do a preview, a full a full frame preview, and 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 uh, look at the effect of things. Of course, you can't do multiple steps when you do that. But I just wanted to comment. I was going to ask why you copied it, but maybe I missed it. Maybe you were doing multiple steps. Yeah. So the the reason, the reason, I, reason is, I copied is oh, there, there's an echo there. There's an echo there. <laughs> John, I'm going to mute you. John, I'm going to mute you. Yeah. So the the reason I copied it was because I wanted to actually blend in uh, the data in different ways using a mask. Um, if you looked at uh, where I did the TGB, I did use previews to experiment. Um, you know, with the noise reduction and things. Okay. Um, so I had a specific so purpose, a specific for, purpose for, for copying that, copying that, all. that, that all. Go, right. go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I, I'm playing mute tag with John. Sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> I'm just looking at Eric's uh, avatar and seeing him smile right now. It makes me laugh <laughs> laughing in the background. <laughs> All right. Well, we actually we had a bunch of viewers on tonight, so um, it was definitely a good uh, a good presentation. Um, Before you guys go, um, could could each of you speak maybe to things that you prefer to do in Pixinsight versus Photoshop? Yeah, Sean, we actually the processes we picked were the ones that I prefer to do in Photoshop. Um, although I grow more and more in what I use in PixInsight. I think David uses PixInsight for everything, but those specific processes are the ones that I mostly use Photoshop for, um, and I do probably almost everything else in PixInsight at this point. Yeah, we, we tried to find things that were fairly common for both of us. Um, um, you know, I, I do do some things in, in Photoshop. Um, you know, I, I do mostly when I'm trying to do things like uh, remove stars. It's a little bit uh, easier and, and does a better job in, in Photoshop than than the tools in PixInsight. Um, but uh, you know, it's one of those things you can do most of the things that you want to do once you've actually stacked your data. So once you have data to to work with a, a linear single image or color image or whatever. Uh, for the most part, you can do everything in one that you can do in the other. It's just a slightly different methodologies. When you're um, swapping the information back and forth from Photoshop to PixInsight and back, what file formats are you using? How are you saving them back and forth? Well, I use a, a TIFF, 16-bit TIFFs, typically when I'm, I'm going back and forth. Do you ever go back to the uh, XISFs? Um, yes. So when I do a final save of my image, uh, I will I'll save it off in the XISF format. Um, but then I'm also typically saving off a JPEG version and things like that for what I'm going to post to the web or uh, do do something else with. I take it then that once you've gotten your initial data, um, and you know from the time you first take it from PixInsight over to Photoshop. From that point on, you're using TIFFs until you're pretty much done? Yeah, any kind of transfer, it's always going to be a TIFF file. Right. Hey, hey, Josh, do you use the same thing? I use the same thing. All 16-bit as well. Yeah. So I have a question for you. Is, can, can you. Have you guys been able to get the 32-bit uh, TIFFs to work in Photoshop? I can never get them to work. There's there's very few there's things, very things, things, things you can do with it. Yeah, I've noticed that. You can, it's hard to even get it into Photoshop. I can get it in, but it's a mess. It shows up as a complete mess. It's like it's 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 either full of bugs or there's there's some very strange thing going on in Photoshop with 32-bit TIFFs. 
Yeah, you have when you import it, you have to you have to work on how it actually converts to sixteen bit as well. Right, and it's and it's and there's there's different ways that you can do it, but I almost can never get it to look on my Photoshop screen like it looks on the Pixit Insight screen whenever I export it. Yeah, I think it's basically as good as unsupported. So uh, at least in Photoshop, although maybe a few versions down the road. Are are, are the 32 bits unsigned integers in photo uh, in Pix Insight? Because you have to save it as 16-bit unsigned to get it to look. Yeah, this. yeah. You, you needed 16-bit unsigned to to transfer, or it has to at least be an integer. It can't be a floating point. Mm -hmm. uh, to convert over to, to Photoshop at all. Um, and quick question: You both used well. This data in particular was uh, pre-processed in PixInsight, color calibrated, etc. PixInsight. Uh, maybe you used G2B calibration, but so right. it's a balance between the color channels. Yeah. So so. I think we did that in PixInsight. I can't remember now, Josh. Yeah, the when you download the data, if you look at it, the what we did was we did all the stacking and the pre-processing in PixInsight, and then I can't remember. I, we either did just a very slight histogram transformation, or we did a, um, or we might have done like a logarithmic intensity transformation. I can't remember which one we did, but. I, I think we just did a, a very minor histogram transformation, both on the luminance and the RGB data. Uh, I think to color yeah. balance it, I think we just did a, a, a linear fit between the channels. Right, and we, we, I do think that we did some kind of background extraction before we stretched it as well. But I, we, I think the first time we did this was a month ago, so I can't remember at this point. But we, but normally we do that in Insight, anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions inside the room, outside the room? Um, next week is Easter, so we'll be off next week. The following week I have nothing scheduled yet, but I'm sure something will be posted in the meantime, so keep your eyes open. And uh, Otherwise, uh, I'm just going to say thank you guys. Great presentation, and we will see everyone next uh, in two weeks. Have a good one.